Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Space Bar. I got two awesome astronauts here with us. We got Taylor Simpson and Greg Jacobson. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hello. Wonderful. Awesome. This is our, our third time doing this, and we've been having a lot of fun every time. Um, so uh, what, what I want to do is just we're going to have a great conversation about culture and about how you build that as you go through different times. But our, as we do every week, we always start off with our capture question so you guys can prove your humanity. Um, so, Taylor, let's start with you. Um, the question is, if, if we were to make a, a play about your life, how many acts would there be in it? Ah, great question. Uh, I love plays first and foremost, so this is an exciting question. How many acts? Uh, you know, I would say really, really three as it stands. Um, I've always sort of tried to split up this current act that I'm in, but I think it's um, all fairly similar. I mean, the learning yeah. that we've done, the commitment that I made to, you know, sort of a goal going through school. I'm discovering myself. I'm, I'm still in a journey of self-discovery. Um, you know, foundation sort of act one. Uh, um, really uh, finding, you know, who I am in, in act two and then finding, um, you know, how I can become that in, in act three. So I, I would say I'm sort of in, in the act three of this of, of my play if, if there was a, you know, a story of my life. Yeah, that's cool. Greg, what about you? Yeah, well, I had the benefit of listening to Taylor think through it. Um, for the record, I my my act number I had already determined before he specified his, but um, I feel like I'm at the end of Act Three and and starting Act Four. I think Act One was clearly um, everything up to um, probably my sophomore year year in in college, where I um, at that point it became pretty pretty clear that I was heading professionally um, to become a physician and uh, um, kind of things shifted. And so act two was becoming a physician and um, was, you know, going through kind of finishing off the the college, the med school, the residency component of that. And then you know, act three was the, the founding of Kinexus and, and, um, and that evolution. And, and I say that we're ending act three and kind of moving to act four because I think the question is no longer, are we going to be successful? Um, I think the question at Kinex is at this point is, and what kind of company do we want to be in, yeah. and how do we define success? And so th that's why this topic really attracted me and Neil and, and why I was like, oh, that's that's a topic we're putting a lot of mind share to um, culture. And so um, Definitely. That's, that, that's our acts. Yeah, I, we got another call, call coming up in a couple of weeks. Where we're talking about what's the finish line like for a company, like what you're saying. <clears throat> How do you define success for sure? Uh, my, my answer is also three. Uh, I think that, that's kind of a easy thing to do, but you know, everything from birth until college time was there. Um, my wife and I went to to live in India for about six years. So that was like the big act two uh, mm -hmm. that was there. Hugely transformative time for us. Um, just changed whole perspective on, on life and business and, and everything. So that, that was a big one. And then returning back to the U.S., um, in 2016, yeah, we're kind of still in, in this third act right now. It's, it's going on. So, so yeah, good answers. You guys all get it right. Good job. Oh. <laughs> so cool. Well, let's, uh, let's give some context here. Uh, we're talking about building cultures and, and keeping them as you grow. Uh, Greg, let's start with you. Um, you, you talked about being a physician, um, which obviously there's some culture around hospitals and everything like that as well, but just tell us who you are in terms of you're the CEO of Kinexus, but what is Kinexus and, and what are your growth plans? Sure. So we are a we're a software company that helps organizations develop and spread cultures of continuous improvement. So the the story started when I was a physician, or still am, but when I was just a physician, <laughs> and learning about continuous improvement and all the improvement disciplines of that, and then you know quickly realizing that having a piece of technology that was designed to help that and could help foster that. Um, ultimately became the shift in my my thought in my career. And so that's what we do. We we help companies that oftentimes are, are utilizing um, principles like Lean and Six Sigma and, um, and uh, continuous improvement Kaizen and providing the, um, the, the technology platform and partnering with them to help them develop their leadership behaviors and help them um, develop their improvement methodologies. So we have about 100 customers now. We're about a 25-person company uh, at this point, and um, 
we uh, just were very fortunate in that um, we just had a, an amazing year. And so um, despite COVID, and so we have uh, pretty aggressive growth plans on, from a headcount perspective. And we'll probably be adding 10 more people um, to, to the company this year and thinking through how we maintain and develop um, our culture has become front of mind because I think that's one of the, the things that people like the most about and working working with Kinexus and working at Kinexus is, is what we've created. So Yeah, awesome. We'll get into that more in a bit. Uh, Taylor, you go. Um, you're the CEO of the Halo app. Um, tell us about where you guys at, what stage you're in, and where your, where your growth, growth plans are taking you. Uh, yeah, we're at a, a stage where we're ready to grow a little bit. Um, I've been working on this for about four and a half years now since the end of or beginning of 2016, and it was um, left my job in architecture to do this, but it was based around just hey, okay, technology is creating all these innovations. Um, why are there you know underserved communities that are missing out on innovation? Right? Why are they missing out on the technology, especially in, in finance? Just because you know there's so much wrong from an equity standpoint in finance. Um, so you know, really dry race board it. You know, how can we build a technology that uh, can put the power back into the people's hands, which is what we've done. Um, by connecting, you know, people to people versus people to institutions, um, and allow and to allow that marketplace to to kind of evolve fairly. I mean, it's a it's a super complex space, so we spent quite a bit of time, um, you know, navigating SEC, you know, really figuring out what you know the regulatory landscape looks like, figuring out technology. When I first started, you know, I had no idea how to build an app, so going through that phase of of actually building and you know algorithms and technology in general. Um, so that was sort of the, the first phase. In alignment with that, you know, we spent a lot of time just talking to people, you know, thousands of uh, our first target market, payday loan users, just thousands of payday loan users to just see what sort of solution would, would even matter. Um, and if our solution or our you know, hypothesis was, was correct or even close to correct. Um, and once we kind of figured that one out, in 2018, we started building, you know, building technology, uh, built it through 2019, started tech in 2019, mm -hmm. about a quarter of a million dollars in loans here in, uh, in 2020. Um, rough year just in terms of, you know, getting through the year and continuing to run a company, uh, which we'll talk about, you know, in terms of some culture aspects of that. But, um, you know, now we've, we've really figured out, and I love what Greg said, just figured out exactly what we want to do and who, who we're going to be. Um, and I think this community model, you know, that we built is so transformative because, um, and we should be supporting each other, you know, financially. There should be no reason our neighbors are, are struggling. You know, I, I know in a previous show we kind of talked about that. Neil, you know, people yeah. that we work with, people that we, you know, that are friends of ours, you know, people that we go to church with, maybe, um, and they're struggling. And you know, we're so against speaking about or being open and honest and transparent about those financial struggles. So our our platform allows you know people to get resources when they need it. Um, to do it confidently and within their community. So um, we look to be, again, pretty aggressive as well. Uh, we're looking to add three, um, you know, three or four people each quarter. Uh, a majority of it's going to be sales for us uh, in, in really driving revenue in 2021. Um, so a huge culture element. I've been reading quite a bit on, you know, maintaining and sustaining culture as you scale. And we're starting to see it, you know, just in these uh, first uh, or early hires. Yeah. Um, definitely in a, you know, sort of a growth sprint here. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think you guys are both at the perfect place to talk about this. Um, Greg, what's one thing about the culture that you have now that you intentionally baked into it, like from the beginning, and then also tell us one thing that has just kind of emerged that you didn't imagine was going to be there, but it is definitely core to your culture right now. I don't know if we have thought intentionally about culture in a um, in an active way initially. I think it um, we I, I love Seth Godin. Mm -hmm. so Seth Godin says um, culture is the definition of uh, it can be defined by people like us do things like this. Right. And so initially the culture was simply I attempted to, to model on behavior. Um, and so it was it was this recognition that the senior leadership was going to interact a certain way and um, and hopefully that trickled down. And, and and then I read something that, that discussed this 
from a standpoint of about at the point when you, you develop about 20 different uh, people at the organization, um, that no longer works and you have to become intentional because not everyone has the ability to interact on a daily um, and sometimes even on an hourly basis with the senior leadership. And so over the last couple of years, we, we, we switched from, you know, people like us do things like this to then becoming more intentional with how we are going to do, to do that. And so we are um, in very intentional now about um, um, being transparent. Um, we're very intentional now about um, everyone's uh, ideas are important and um, they need to be evaluated. Um, and then I'll give one, one aspect of our culture that um, was kind of by accident that we realized we came across that is becoming part of our DNA, which is we want to develop a reading culture at Kinexus. Hmm. And that was um, just, we decided um, we want uh, all of us to start reading more. And we made it the year of reading for 2020. And we just realized like, it's not going to be a year reading at Kinexus. It's just at Kinexus, we are going to um, promote reading and we're doing book clubs now where we're reading um, different books and kind of breaking them up and then having conversations about them. And so that has been a, a part of our culture that um, has been kind of unintentional, um, but intentional now yeah. that I, I think other people might gain from. Have you started to pull that into your recruiting process too? Like you ask somebody like at the test, like what books did you read this last month? And if they said nothing, then you may not be a fit here. Um, I have not specifically asked that, but we, with our interview process, lots of people ask lots of different things. <laughs> and so it, it's pretty clear in a, 30 minute conversation with someone, which is our, our interviews are typically about 30 minutes. Um, well, sometimes they, they go longer. You can start telling pretty quickly if someone is um, reading a, a quite a bit or, or not reading, but it's a great way to kind of infuse uh, external knowledge into, into a company um, and uh, highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Cool, Taylor. What about you? Uh, tell us what, what's like the the core of, of the culture that you're trying to create there at the Halo app. Well, um, uh, I would say that um, really the the same uh, thing is sort of our mission statement. We speak a lot about uh, freedom, you know, for people, and and that can be self defined. You know, freedom for you know, in our market, of power can be you know, saving three hundred bucks on a loan uh, just to have that to be able to infuse back in their family for backers. It could just be a, a regular stream of income or just the feeling of it all. Um, and so freedom is very important to me. I honestly took everything I hated about, you know, my previous workplaces and made a what not to do list. Um, give, give us one example of that. What, what's yeah. something that you're intentionally not doing? Micromanaging. Oh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I hated it as in, it could just be my personality type. Cause I'm also learning, you know, I kind of went all the way right and then now I'm bleeding back into the middle because you know there are certain types uh, within the company that need you know to be a bit micromanaged um and, and to not take it negatively um so there can't you know just be a you know a, you know hey listen I, I need you to work autonomous all the time <laughs> it, just, yeah. it just can't be that you know, inside of the company so really just learning um, taking what I what I hated about workplaces, like just micromanaging, not having the space, being in a box, not being able to use you know a, a additional skill sets, feeling like my voice is not heard. Uh, I think freedom's first. The second for us is just uh, really aggressive candor and transparency, um, and it, it starts with me uh, a lot of the time. Just being incredibly open and, and honest with you know what's going on and what what the vision is for the company and um, how I feel about, you know, the team and the employees being asking for feedback, um, which kind of set the tone for uh, crucial conversations we read as a team. So just, you know, me asking for feedback a lot, you, you know, you kind of know my personality type, but I came into this space knowing I was going to be imperfect and just trying to grow as much as possible. And, you know, I kind of use that with the team too. Um, so yeah, definitely freedom. Uh, you should have the freedom to do your best work. The freedom to ask, the freedom to uh, to have an opinion, the, you know, the freedom to uh, talk about what you think is not going right, and then also on the other end, just you know, really aggressive candor and, and transparency, uh, especially for the leaders in the company. Yeah, you guys both mentioned transparency as as a a value you want to have in your mm -hmm. culture. How does transparency look different 
now at the st certain state you're at versus like when you have like say let's just take the next like 50 people in the company um is that does that value look different in those different stages 50 100 200 people i don't think so <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think obviously the, uh, the depth and the, the practical tactical nature of it's going to be different, but I don't think the spirit of transparency should be different. I think that the, um, the, the concept of, of trying to be true to kind of what's going on behind the scenes, I think is, is really important. And I think people can immediately tell when they don't see authenticity. Mm. And so while the, the topics could be different, I, I, I just like, for example, we're, we're very transparent about our financial situation and we like, right. we tripled down on that throughout COVID just to let everyone know that, you know, the company wasn't going off a cliff. Um, and uh, we have a ton of metrics that are available to everyone to see. I, I just, I don't really see a reason why we would ever not have people have access to a lot of that stuff. It doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like it would promote um, anything different. Um, if we were a hundred people big versus 20 people big, but yeah, I, or, I could be wrong. You know? I, I guess a di different way to phrase the question is like, what, because there's, you always have to make the decision to be transparent in different situations. Yeah. So what's, what's maybe a different um, situation that would force you to be transparent in a different way as you get bigger, I guess, like one thing, sharing the financials, okay, like that, no matter how big the company is, that's always gonna be there. But do you anticipate there'd be any other things where you'd be like, we'll take that deep breath. Okay, we're being transparent, so we gotta do this. Like, can you imagine a situation like that as you grow bigger? <clears throat> Taylor, uh, was, was that correct? Right yeah, I was gonna say, I didn't yeah. want to. Come in. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking through it, Dig. I would just say not. You know, like mm -hmm. um, we've sort of already moved into it. It was, you know, it was odd, you know, for me to be transparent with a team of five. <laughs> um, just going from, you know, doing everything, being everything, um, keeping everything tight knit. Um, you know, that was a big step. Yeah. For us as a company, because you know we are the company in the early stages. So as a company, it was a big step to be, you know, hugely transparent. Um, in this in this stage that we're in, uh, or the previous stage, um, but I think that set the tone uh, because I think the I think the uh, the risk there is you know with a team of five or ten you know it's it's really um, you know, me driving culture pieces or trying to set a strong foundation. But you know as we scale, and one of my biggest fears, uh, and a lot of what I've been reading is you know how can or have you done your job enough so that you know others are spreading that same culture and those same foundational elements? Um, so I, I think uh, I would just like, or I guess in the future, just for lay leaders and future leaders to to do the same thing because there could always be a stopgap somewhere. You know, maybe you know the marketing department, whoever's leading that, is like, no, we're not going to be transparent about. Mm -hmm. You know how much we're spending, or you know how much value is being, or sales department for me is how much value each person is bringing. Because I feel like that's always something that's withheld um, in my previous workplaces. What have I done? You know, like have I brought in a million dollars? Yeah. You know, and it, it, I think you know that's held off or withheld because you know, that you know, affects pay conversation, right? But you know, you want people to know the value that they're bringing because a lot, of, a lot of times, it's a huge motivator. Um, so just ensuring that, you know, as you know, my direct leadership starts to dilute a bit, that some of those, uh, some of those standards, those cultural standards stay in place. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Greg, are, are you, when you, when you think about the future, um, like, what is it that you are really wanting to defend? And I guess more so, like, what are you scared about losing as you get bigger? Um, scrappiness. Yeah. That's huge. That's really big. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what I fear. I fear I fear that a lot of the reason why we've gotten where we're at is we're we're scrappy, and um, and that's partly what makes makes the job fun, and it partly feels like you're an underdog, and um, 
I, the more we can continue to do that, despite uh, how big we get or how financially secure we get or what the balance sheet looks like, the better we're going to be in the long run. And I think the more fun we're going to have. Yeah, um, that's a that's a part of our culture that we talk about a lot. Like, if it's not fun, then um, then I, I wonder, you know, why we're doing it. That doesn't mean that we're financially irresponsible. Um, it it means in many ways we're being more financially responsible. Um, because if you work in a place that that's fun to work at, um, that that uh, really supports a huge retention, and our our, ret our our retention numbers show it. People, um, when people leave companies, they take a huge amount of value away from companies, and so the longer you can keep good people around, um, the better. So, um, <clears throat> scrappiness. Scrap. How, how does do you feel like scrappiness is something that even like as you grow in, in different phases too, like it's it, it's going to be more difficult to do. And, and how like how would you if you start to sense that you're losing that sense, like what would be the leverage you'd want to pull to kind of bring it back? It's a great question. <laughs> I mean, to me, the the levers there are you don't need a perfect solution before you you start doing something. Number one, um, you don't lead with solving the problem with money. Number two. And, um, and you, I hate failure. Um, I never intend to, to go forward with failure, but if you are paralyzed because of the potential failure, then, um, you won't ever get anything cool done. And so like those, those three things are the, the first three things that come to my mind. Um, I know that there's like this, this lore in the startup world of like, you know, fail fast and fail furious and all that. And I'm just like, you know, that's, <laughs> that's BS. I, I never want to fail. Um, I always want to just um, win. But um, I think the real spirit of that um, is uh, the, the, the lack of doing something because of the paralysis of the potential of failure is really what people are trying to say there. Not right. that it's good to fail because no, it's, it's not good to fail. But, um, but if you're not doing something because of, because of, of that fear, well then, boy, you sure are not meeting your potential. And so, um, we've, we've done a whole bunch of things. <laughs> Thank you, Taylor. We've done a whole bunch of things that, in retrospect, we were like, "Oh my gosh, what were we doing?" Um, but uh, many of those things turned out to be um, our best and shiniest moments. And so, yeah. that's scrappy in my that's in my. Great. <laughs> Taylor, what about you? What are you What are you afraid of? Um, I would ag agree, and, and also taking some mentorship here um, from someone that's you know slightly further along. I, I love that. Just like, how do you maintain the culture of scrappiness? Because I mean, that's been <laughs> the entire story up to now, and things are going to get a lot better much quicker. Um, so, yeah, uh, and and I'd love to you know even talk about it you know even deeper just as we continue to grow. I really don't have a you know a solution for that. I've always been the person that you know, tried to lead by example. And, and that's, you know, my primary attribute. I didn't know what this space was going to look like, but I knew I was going to put my head down and I was going to find solutions. I knew I wasn't going to have an enormous amount of resources either. And that's exactly what Greg's kind of talking about. Um, so, it's, yeah, that's that's a huge fear. We're going to have a, a lot of resources, you know, soon. <laughs> um, and as we scale the company, um, you know, is that culture going to stay and, and how do you keep it? So that's, that's probably going to be, you know, as I'm developing my questions for you, Craig, uh, we're probably going to dive in a little bit deeper into that because I, I have not, you know, to be completely honest, thought about it. Um, you know, I think uh, people not loving this, uh, you know, as as much, um, you know, people taking shortcuts, especially with customers, I think is a huge fear of mine. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, you know, that is our business, uh, that is our you know, core differentiator, just the way that we make people feel from top to bottom, um, especially being in a space where, you know, people are treated like crap and they feel like crap for a majority of the time they're with our competitors. Um, you know, out, outside of that, um, you know, not, not too much. Um, I, I think those would be the, I think those yeah. my, my two, you know, for the most part, just because we're at, kind of at that stage, um, Greg and Neil. So uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to learn more about like how you, you can create like an infectious scrappy uh, within the company, but two, 
um, you know, as resources start to come and as the, the company gets more footing and, you know, you're able to, you know, spend more here, you know, spend more there. How do you, I read a book once about a leader that, you know, was flipping computer paper um, and, you know, what that tone set for the company was extraordinary. I mean, just the fact that like, hey, here's a scrap pile, we're going to flip it. People can use it as note paper. I mean, that, to see that uh, as a as a person working in a company is probably extraordinary. So yeah, just go over some tips there. Awesome. Well, well, Taylor, go ahead and ask ask Greg your question. What do you want to say? Yeah, just um, just thinking through it uh, because you've already hit a blitz of just keeping culture or keeping things like you know scrappiness within your company. Just what are some you know even if it's just uh, three bullet points like these are three things that you absolutely have to do. Um, to maintain, you know, a lot of those core elements that made you successful at the very beginning? Uh, I, my first answer is uh, when I figure it out, I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> I, uh, in, in part of the spirit of transparency, we talk a lot about how um, many people in their positions, they haven't been in that position before. And yeah. to me, that that is as much of a liability as an asset. And it's, it's really just how you put your framework of your um, approach to it. And so to me, that's an asset. And so I, having said that, not every hire is like that. I mean, sometimes you, you just, I mean, you, you need to hire for experience. Um, but this, this idea that you, that, that every kind of person at one point did that job the, the first time. And so, um, allowing people that freedom um, will kind of create that creativity. Yeah. And uh, then uh, um, you combine that with a, a deep sense of, of respectful um, um, devil's advocate, um, which to me is just kind of critical thinking and, and, and analysis. Like there's no reason that if someone is a good critical thinker, you couldn't give them the data behind uh, um, a situation and, and even someone with 20 years of experience, um, perhaps th that person with 20 years of experience will or will not come up with, and I'm using air quotes here in case you're just listening to it, the right answer. Yeah. And so um, I think that, um, I think that that's a, like another big aspect of, of, of how we're trying to do things. And then I affectionately refer to myself as the agitator sometimes. Um, and, uh, so I, I mean that in a loving way, just to mix things up with how are we thinking through something and is it the right approach or is it not the right approach? And that's not to say I know exactly the right answer, but I think kind of having that mentality. Um, and I also think, um, don't, I don't think scrappiness is always a dollar and cents thing. Um, although it frequently is, um, <laughs> it, it's not always that, um, and so uh, th that's the only other kind of kind of aspect I would I would think through. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of got that image from back then movie Apollo 13, where like the guys are on at NASA are building the the thing the scrub scrubber thing to save them. Like that's scrappiness, and those guys had all the money in the world uh, to to get that done. Such a great that's such a great example of scrap. Yeah. Yes, that's beautiful. Yeah, awesome. All right, Greg, close us out here. Give Taylor a question. Um. How are you thinking through? So we went completely virtual, obviously. Um, in in March, um, we aren't a manufacturing company; we're a digital company. But how are you thinking through? Is your company in the future have an office? It's a hybrid, or it's completely remote? Um, oh, absolutely! I have this um, obviously hybrid, um, just because I think you know certain elements of the company need like close knit collaboration. Um, but, you know, I have this, you know, huge vision. One of our investors actually runs a company called uh, Bevy Systems, uh, which grew out of a startup grind. And uh, Bevy has this super unique you know, conference platform, but there's no reason that uh, that couldn't be uh, used in sort of a, a virtual office space, you know, where you have like a main stage or you have a main room where everybody can come in and you have breakouts uh, where each team can do their, you know, whiteboarding sessions or go over their huddles. Um, but I think there's a huge opportunity to, you know, to have a virtual space in the future. You know, I, the biggest thing for me is just that same line, the communications, um, setting, you know, 
you know, they sound goofy sometimes, but you have to set like a virtual culture. Like if, if, if people are checking in or raising, you know, if people are saying hi in the morning or if there's a huddle meeting and, you know, it, it's not a huddle and we're all behind, you know, the computer, but, you know, people are getting energized, like make sure people are fully committed to it. You know, if there's a Slack channel, we're going to have a Slack meeting, make sure you're in the Slack meeting. Um, so, you know, what we've been just really trying to figure out is like what communication standards are we going to use? But I think the ability to hire and grow and just like, you know, communicate with people and attend and network, you know, from all over the country um, makes it a no brainer for businesses, you know, if, if possible. Um, and again, it goes back to the first thing. I think uh, certain things, I think our sales, you know, I, I love that energy of just, you know, people being on top of each other and motivating each other. Um, so, I mean, stuff like that, you might not be able to mimic, but I see the future of the office place is virtual. We, we see it in Silicon Valley. You know, they're, they're all going back to, you know, Chicago and Jersey and Connecticut and, you know, sitting on a couch with their families. Um, and I'm sure it's like an aha moment for, you know, these $40 billion mortgage <laughs> mortgages that are out there. That's like, well, this is interesting. You know, we got another 22 years of this. So, um, I'm excited to see more people virtual. You know, I miss being in the midst of, you know, people in, in teams and you know, high-fiving and getting excited and, you know, late night sessions on a dry race board. But um, there's just so much more opportunity, I think, that it opens up. Yeah. It's a great question, Greg. And it's one that not next week, but uh, in two or three weeks for me talking specifically about that, right. because I think it's, it's an important one for us all to be talking about, because a lot of people had the office system down decently well. We kind of figured out how to do culture well. Yeah. And then we were thrown into this virtual environment right. where we had to figure out how to do that. And now we're talking about going to hybrid. And what most people don't realize is that's a, that's a third thing. They're like it's right. something you don't have experience with. You got to figure that out too. Yeah. Uh, so it's not like you're just taking the best of both. You got to build something new from the beginning. So yeah. that's cool. That's that's what, what you just said is kind of where my mind is headed when I think through this, because I do feel like at least for Kinexus, a hybrid is probably going to be where it's at. And then thinking through like, okay, well, is hybrid the best of this and the best of that? And then that would be a really simple um, way to think through it. But I, I think it will not um, represent what what hybrid is really going to be about. And so I think yep. that's like the really challenging um, part that, that you, you hit on. So um, it's just going to be a very interesting evolution. Um, yep. that I'm, I'm looking forward to this challenge because I... I'm so much into, we're reading, I said we're doing a uh, book club. So this is the book we're reading right now. Nice. I got to the chapter. Um, so I, I just uh, um, held up the seven habits of highly effective people. And we just got to the win-win chapter. Um, and so I, I think we, we need to figure out like how, how does hybrid um, kind of as a birth of these two different paradigms become way better than both of them at the same time. And I think yeah. it's an, an interesting evolution. So Awesome. Well, Taylor, Greg, thanks so much for, for joining us here at the Space Bar. Um, it's always great to chat with you guys. We look forward to having you back again sometime soon. Thanks so much, Neil. Thanks, Taylor.